So are you able to see the screen? Yes, miss. Okay, good stuff. So just to do a bit of a recap in terms of what we've covered very briefly. So the first learning outcome, this unit, you know, when we look at, let me define it this way. When I look at global talent management, what do I see, uh, you know, the reasons of studying this particular unit under human resources? One is that the traditional function of human resources as we see the seven or 10 functions of human resources management as we see over the decades have, you know, undergone a lot of change. So when we look at this change happening, especially uh, because of factors like globalization, because of factors like companies having offices in different countries or operations in different countries, we look at workforce diversity. We also look at increasing complexity of, uh, you know, managing workforce, which is brought in by legislation in particular, uh, and the labor laws which are implemented in different countries where the companies operate. And last but not the least, uh, the need for people to stay and retain them within an organization has given rise to the concept of something called talent management. So in learning outcome one, we understood what is talent management. So we defined uh, talent in terms of, you know, the process of managing, uh, you know, people within an organization in order to retain them, train them, develop them uh, in order to look at planning their succession, which is primarily referred to as promotions and also to create uh, opportunities for the right set of people to be getting into leadership or you know strategic positions within the organization. This bit was you know um, important because we wanted to differentiate between the process of human resource planning (HRP) and where the process, human resource planning ends is where the actual uh, process of talent, managing talent within an organization or managing people within the organization according to their expectation actually starts. In the learning outcome two, what we looked at was we understood what are the factors which are, uh, you know, essentially, um, you know, impacting the, uh, you know, management of this talent, and impacting management of people uh, in organizations which are, which have global operations or in organizations which have, you know, different um, uh, let's put it this way, which, have, which offer different products and services. And that is where the right suitability along with, uh, you know, the skills and experience um, comes into being wherein this uh, is differentiated very clearly from human resources planning process and uh, the talent management process. So an example there would be, which we looked at in learning outcome two was that when we look at incentive perks and bonuses at the lower level, when an employee is new in the organization, this tends to change to rewards. This tends to change into something called rewards and compensation when we look at more. Um, sorry. Yes, I said I'm in the office. You can come through the door. This, uh, sorry about that. So this tends to change to something called, uh, you know, the process of um, reward compensation when we people uh, in senior mid to senior management uh, specifically. We also then looked at in learning outcome to understanding about what are the barriers, uh, you know, which basically impact the management of talent. So things like, you know, when we look at recrossing, uh, resourcing and recruiting, we look at, you know, things which basically mean, mean that sometimes you require local people, uh, even in uh, when, when companies are global in operation, they need to have local expertise in people. So there are lots of barriers, which are cultural barriers, which are law and legislation barriers. There are barriers which are related to, uh, you know, the, um, say, for example, in this case, we looked at, say, for example, intra-company transfers. So the example that I took up in this, in Learning Outcome 2, was that when we look at the H-1B visas, specifically in the U.S., a lot of your companies look at transferring employees from one geography to the other because of the shortage of talent or the shortage of right amount of manpower with skills and experience required to work within that organizational setup. And those in terms of legislation tend to become barriers for managing, uh, you know, the expectation of individuals, but also the organizations, uh, you know, which have global operations. And then we also looked at understanding what are the key challenges which are currently being faced by organizations uh, in terms of managing this talent uh, or, you know, managing people which have uh, Talent, that means talent would mean the right fitment in terms of, uh, you know, skills, uh, experience, knowledge and information, which, uh, which is required for the organizations to grow, achieve their plans 
or you know hit the revenue targets whatever it is and that is where we use the term that okay why the why do companies look at need why do companies need to manage uh, you know people and their expectations because if they don't manage them either in terms of perks and uh, you know compensation and rewards or in terms of training and development or in terms of growth within the organization then you will see that people end up leaving or, or get po- you know kind of uh, recruited by com- competitors and that is where the organization ends up uh, you know losing um, say revenue market share or you know uh, they see a bit of a dip in the business because the person crucial and vital in that role has left the organization suddenly wherein the succession planning has not been done and by the time somebody steps into their uh, you know uh, in, into that role and responsibility uh, we see that the company has uh you know or does it does take a bit of a dip in terms of its business now in the third learning outcome what we are going to be doing is we are going to be understanding so before this in the second learning outcome we also looked at something called uh we understood the various aspects of global talent management so global talent management the seven steps or the the process that we looked at then we also looked at you know the uh, the uh, the aspect of what is global management go global talent management strategy so what how does talent management strategy tie into organizational strategy for large organizations or businesses in particular and that is something that you have to uh, you know look at when we look at you know learning outcome too so we there is a guy called asad which is come usko in the name and in the learning outcome tree what we are going to be doing is primarily you know um mix uh, you know basically bringing in the two aspects of uh, you know the talent management which is basically managing people which are uh, high end resources in the organization and why they are vitally important for the organizational strategy so when i look at using the word organizational strategy there are a couple of things which come to our mind things like mission of the company vision of the organization why the uh, organization was formed what is the ethos and when we look at these things these things are defined in the working document or you know some sort of a document which is a strategic document for the organization to say we are looking at moving this company uh, you know to this direction in 5 years 10 years 15 years and that is where you know the the vital part of organizational strategy actually comes into being so here what we are going to do is understand the role of hr within hr somebody who manages uh, you know people um with high stakes within the organization which have good experience knowledge everything uh, you know um everything in the organization and that how it is important for the organization uh, you know to marry it with with regards to you know ensuring that the strategy that they have is actually uh, going to you know those are the people who will actually carry out the um, you know the um, actions or carry out the actions to basically achieve that goal objective which has been set by the organization so that is what we are going to look at you know in uh, learning outcome 3 is that okay are you guys okay okay, okay yes, sir. sir any questions on this so far no okay so let's look at um, when we see you know how do we understand the relationship between global talent management and organizational strategy so the pretext to this is if you look at a bit of an introduction or a background uh, you know sometimes you will see that um, you know when businesses expand or they are expanding operations by opening up a new branch or an office in a different country um, there is always a need for the company to recruit people within the organization sometimes they will see that there will be one or two people which will go in from the head office or from a respective branch office to a new uh, set of operation and they will kick start the point uh, you know of uh, basically recruiting people from the local local geography or the local area so here when when we look at the process of recruitment and selection uh, it begins with a company or a business deciding to you know open operations maybe in another in another location and that location could be a country a state you know or a or a different geography altogether now when we look at uh, the need for company to expand there are a couple of things which they look at why they are expanding they could be expanding because they want to increase business they want to attract new customers the, it could be because the, the company which you know creates the products and services also gets a bit of raw material 
from that particular geography and they want to you know attract that particular market so there could be a number of reasons why a company decides to expand and when the company decides to expand at some stage there is a plan which is created by hr because there will be a financial plan there will be a operational plan there will be you know a plan related to engineering which will look after products or services or the you know things which are going to be manufactured or things like that but at some stage there will be one plan which will be a plan to look at how many people will be required what are the resources what kind of people job descriptions would be required to run that side of operations in that location and that is where when we look at the process of recruitment and selection actually starts because they will put out maybe an advert or you know start activities with recruitment organizations which will primarily look at you know uh, putting a putting out a job advert and that job advert would start looking at the process of shortlisting you know people applying and then finally leading to a process of selection of individuals which are fit to fit for purpose or fit for that job role now last but not the least when we look at sometimes when the company is expanding operations into a different geography you will see that in those countries or in those locations what tends to happen is that the um, hr is conscious of the fact that they need to rip, to be able to recruit people which will be able to work within the existing company setup whether it's the organization the structure or the culture okay or the culture so in that aspect what we look at on that aspect what we look at in 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 that aspect that we look at is primarily the aspect of you know um, they want to bring in people which have uh, you know the qualities or are able to you know come in into an organization and understand the culture the existing setup and are able to kind of assimilate some of the good uh, you know expectations uh, i won't say good expectation but assimilate some of the good uh, practices which the company wants which are you know things like uh, sometimes they need individuals which are proactive which are able to work within a team they have good experience in terms of their skills uh for which they are being hired and last but not the least they are able to you know come in and not disturb the apple cart but are able to pick up the strategic thinking of the organization and are able to contribute and take it forward so when we look at these particular things that uh, you know this particular aspect of recruitment and selection when the company is looking at expanding into a new location or a geography because of the globalization aspect of uh, the organization or the large set of operations of the uh, you know organization this is where the relocation rebuilding or rebalancing of the existing talent within the organization happens and to a certain extent if they can't source that uh, talent when i say when they can't source the required the right type of required people to take up that role the organization from an hr perspective has to start look at doing recruitment and selection in that location to bring in people from that local geography is this bit uh, clear riyanka are you clear on this what i've explained yes i am i'm so sorry i had to mute myself because of my son so i won't disrupt the class right. yes i'm clear so the basic pretext in to summarize why we look at this process starting off in an organization is that if an example here and the scenario being the company is looking at expanding overseas like for example tesco expanded to the us they i started the hr department started identifying which people within the organization had the relevant experience skill set and knowledge about the geography culture background which could be relocated to the us market to kick start the operations of the uh, of the company but at some stage this did not mean that all the resources from uk operations or european operations were moved to the us but what they said was a key set of people were being moved uh, for a temporary basis so that they can kick start the operations and also start the business at a later stage uh, along with this the company decided to decides to hire you know people or staff which will be working within the us side of things and that uh, recruitment and selection you know uh, also starts parallelly as a process by hr now the difference between the two is when you look at uh, staff being relocated from the us uh, sorry the uk or the european geography to the us operations yeah. for a point of time uh, for a short duration of time one year to year clear means that they have the required talent which means they can work <laughs> in that can, can i 
quickly come in here. Can I ask yeah. you a question? Yeah. I remember yesterday we talked about the working visa and all that um, if someone is employed in a company and you're, let's say you're posted or you're yeah. required to work in another uh, state or country or province, yeah. either way, it's uh, now to acquire the working visa, is it on the organization or the individual in himself? See, in the, in the case of the H-1B visa, which I gave an example, that is primarily, uh, you know, uh, allocated to companies. So there are companies which get the allocation of 5,000, 7,000, 10,000, depending on the size of operation. So maybe gets a chunk of it. You know, I think there are about 150,000 H-1B visas which are issued every year in the U.S. And Microsoft gets about 25, 30,000 of those visas. So they apply for it in the quota system, but it depends on merit how the you know, the uh, U.S. Immigration Service actually, uh, you know, provides those pieces. But it is normally for a company, not for an organization. Okay, so it's for a company, not for an individual. Yeah, it is for a company or an organization, not an individual. Okay, okay. That's why I wanted to be clear. Uh, the the dealing of that, in terms of when we say, uh, you know, the department which deals with the application, uh, and applying for those visas within a company would be the HR department which does it. Now within the HR, they are not looking at bringing in because there are regulations against that. So say the US authority does not allow people who are unskilled, semi-skilled to be brought in, but they would want people with high level of skill to come in under that visa because those resources are not available. So in those cases, under the visa category, they define the kind of people which can be recruited for that, uh, uh, you know, for that visa by the company. But the HR department plays that role because they then dif start differentiating that this individual has a bachelor's degree, this has a master's degree, and this has a PhD. They've been working in the organization for five years, 10 years, 15 years. These are the skill set. And on the basis of that, the applications are made. And that is where they have to identify pe right people with the right skills and experience. Now, are there, are there procedures for, for acquiring the visa? You're saying they have to look at the... Um, um, educational qualification, if you're qualified, that's when they give you the visa or what? Well, it is, it is basically, you know, uh, I, I don't know in terms of the details, but if we look at, you know, the U.S. Um, immigration service uh, basically allows uh, this visa to be, you know, uh, it's, it's, there are a number of visas which, is, which are issued every year. But this category is something which is called the specialized occupation category. That means only people with certain specific experience, background, educational background, and skill set can come into the country for uh, working. And this is only possible if the company is, uh, you know, issuing this visa to a worker rather than, you know, an uh, employee or a worker or an individual applying for it directly with the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service. So it is on behalf of the company. The company has the right to be able to offer this visa. The HR then starts looking at which kind of persons would qualify for this, and they go through, maybe each company would have its own process of, you know, shortlisting, things like that. But these visas are generally issued in the field of things like, you know, biotechnology, computing, chemistry, you look at maybe, you know, the areas which are related to medicine, uh, when you look at doctors and nurses and other things, and also specialist, um, you know, categories, like when you look at accounting, but not accounting in general, you might look at taxation, you might look at, for example, um, you know, bid writing, when you look at, you know, very specialized categories for which there is shortage of talent within, within the country. And that is where the companies are able to, you know, apply for this visa. And then inter, do the intercompany transfer of employees from one location to the other. And they then tend to be only employed by that company for that contract or for that period of time. And the individual cannot switch over to another category. But all this process comes under the process of HR. And to a certain extent is an example of how HR departments then look at managing, you know, the people which have the brightest uh, qualities, experience, skill set within the organization or not, uh, you know, basically not having them leave the organization, but to make them loyal, motivated, they transfer them from one geography to the other to say, okay, you can go and, uh, you know, obviously um, sharpen your skills or use your expertise in this location, the company needs you and that is where they would, you know, transfer them over. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, there are various reasons why companies would do that. One is they could give out incentives. 
So I've been working in the company for 20 years. I've been quite loyal, achieving targets, you know, doing everything possible. But there is no growth for me possible. So what they tend to do is they will intensive incentivize me and put me into a different location and send me out for two years, three years and as, as an expert to a different location as an incentive to say that, okay, because you're in that geography, you're getting paid higher because of the exchange rate or whatever. And it tends to retain people within the organization. Also gives them the second reason could be the experience which they need that person to have so that at some stage when he or she becomes the head of the organization and manages global operation, they have worked within different locations of the company to understand culture, nuances, legislation, you know, different, uh, have worked with different people and setups. And that also adds to the advantage because this is HR playing, uh, you know, not playing, let me say, this is HR, uh, you know, differentiating employees, performing, high performing employees from employees within the organization, which, uh, you know, are coming in and doing the job, but there are employees which are overachieving year on year and employees which need or deserve more. And that is where the differentiation then creates created on terms of reward, compensation, you know, promotions, or, you know, when we look at uh, progression or succession planning. So those are the reasons you look at incentives, you look at experience building, you look at uh, companies utilizing their internal strategy to be able to deploy one person in the uh, uh, one person from one location to the other because that person has been able to create success and uh, so various reasons can come in when we look at um, you know that aspect of uh, you know um, um, utilization of say H1B visas. I know, okay. for example, in the case of uh, UK. As I mentioned earlier, it's a lot of people who reach top positions within the company, they try and manage. The company gives them the opportunity to become and manage operations for UK and Ireland. But at some stage, if they realize that this person is going to be expected to take up a further leadership position within the company, then the company would look at also move, moving that person into a different location to get experience, working experience within that culture, environment, geography. And that would then allow the person to migrate or, you know, basically uh, step up to a higher responsibility uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the uh, operations of the company. And sometimes you will see person then would manage Western Europe. So they will manage Belgium, Netherlands, you know, France, uh, and then also manage UK and Ireland. And then similarly, a higher position would mean that they go into managing the whole of European region or before stepping into maybe or getting shortlisted for a CEO or a high level position within the organization. Now, having understood all that, so let's get into learning outcome three. The pretext is you should clearly understand what is the difference between talent management and when do we say human resource management. So human resource management, initial level, initial years of the planning. But when we look at talent management, strategic positioning, long-term planning and people who are high performing people or employees within the organization would then be under the category or the scanner of talent management or people management because it's like if you have two simple example that i would give is if you look at uh, you know say kids in uh, high school you have somebody who's actually coming in the first top three and then you have somebody who's in the uh, you know in the mid of the class and then you have some people at the some children at the bottom of the class now, how the differentiation happens is the teachers actually push and challenge the ones which are in the mid or the middle of the class in terms of middle of achievement. They are pushed forward to go and become high achievers. The ones which are high achievers are pushed further to achieve more. And they are given, uh, you know, uh, say, for example, more preference in terms of, uh, you know, let's say sharpening some of the uh, skills which are required for them to, you know, maybe move or progress further. Similarly, in offices, when you look at our businesses, when you look at you have different type of sales managers or employees. If you have an example, five sales managers, one of them is outperforming all the uh, all the others uh, in his team year on year. You will see that that person becomes more, uh, you know, it be, that person might become a favorite and would be more in line to, you know, look at uh, uh, getting a promotion or getting a senior responsible senior role or responsibility because he's consistently overachieving or overperforming. So similarly, when we look at the process of talent management, you will see that the people who are overperforming or are performing above expectations would get uh, in that particular category wherein they will be kind of separated from people who are achieving 100% and still contributing to the organization 
but they will be looking after the performance appraisal side of things. But when you look at people who are high achievers, they will fall into the talent management side of things because you do not want them to leave the organization or at some stage, you know, uh, be uh, kind of, you know, poached by your competitors because having to lose them would mean that you will lose business or, you know, some sort of uh, operations have an effect on operations directly. Now, let's understand what are the impacts of globalization and why do why is it related to uh, you know talent management now some of the factors that are covered in the slide basically are explained so one of the clear reasons why we look at today talent management becoming important is that globalization of human capital is happening that means a company having a base in one location is now expanding to a lot of other locations and they need to send out workers which are trained uh, and have experience within the job within a particular country. Here, I will give you an example of, say, um, you know, Netherlands, for example, or Dutch. Now, they are renowned in terms of engineering might because they are, uh, as a country, they, you know, are very successful in reclaiming land from oceans. That means it's a very small country, and because uh, they are constantly reclaiming land from ocean, basically, you know, they're creating small islands within oceans to expand their country. They are chosen by default to do projects in, you know, Middle East or in other countries wherein they are also trying to do similar developments wherein, you know, uh, protection against, for example, uh, storms which hit the country, uh, oceanic storms which hit the country, or when it comes to, you know, developing systems which are defenses to protect them against harsh weather conditions. Now, when we look at that, what you get to see in the Middle East when all the product projects are happening, especially in Abu Dhabi, UAE, Bahrain, Qatar, you will see a lot of these projects have been given to, you know, companies from the Netherlands. Now, here, when they take up these projects, a lot of workers from Netherlands actually go and work uh, in those projects, uh, you know, in those locations. And that means that they, they hire people and workers locally from that geography, but they tend to be people who are hired primarily for skilled, semi-skilled jobs, but uh, unskilled or semi-skilled jobs, not for skilled jobs, because skilled jobs or managers essentially go from these companies because they have the experience of doing this for a number of years. And that is where the role of, you know, globalization have, uh, comes in, because when you look at companies like these, they work from projects to projects, and the same set of manpower moves from one location to the other. And here is where they need to deal with the complex situation of visas, work permits, housing of their members or employees when they move into that location. And they also need to train them uh, on certain issues, which are, say, for example, cultural issues or uh, language issues, which they need to learn. And that is where they need to acquire new talent to be able to quickly train their manpower so that when they work within that location for a time-bound period, they have the local knowledge or the knowledge which has been acquired by training or by uh, you know employing local staff, which will enable that. Say, for example, translation services between Arabic and Dutch, for example. They might also look at doing uh, putting their employees under a bit of training because they would need to be sensitized on the cultural nuances within the Middle East when when people work there. So those reasons, when you look at, are reasons that which, wherein companies and the setups which they are working in, they need to mobilize their resources wherever the business is available. And that's the point that I'm trying to make on this slide, which is basically saying globalization of human capital. That means people are no longer working in one location. They can be moved from one location to the other, depending on the business and size of, uh, you know, company and the operations they work in. And they have to be open to movement because of the fact that the company depends on them and the company also looks after them by providing them training and uh, you know giving them opportunities to adapt to the local culture so that they are able to perform and obviously you know uh, take up these positions in other locations is this point clear yes Liz. okay the next point that we look at is we look at corporate and cultural differences now sometimes you will see that uh, you know when we talk about um, you know, uh, we have definitely heard about, I think you would have heard about, uh, you know, that you work within different companies. You work within Chinese companies, Japanese companies, American companies, European companies. They have different culture within the companies. Have you have you heard this term? The difference of cultures between when you work for different companies in different locations. Um, is, you said, 
What time have I heard? I didn't get that. I didn't get a question. Right. If you look at dipping into the first unit that we studied, you know, organization behavior and strategic human resource management. Yes. In that, we had studied that the organizational setup and the structure sometimes is influenced by the organizational culture. So when you look at Japanese organizations, they tend to have a flat structure or a hierarchical structure. Most large Japanese conglomerates have a very hierarchical structure. When you look at most American companies, they have a very flat structure. When you look at most European companies, they have a functional structure. Now, the structure of the organization to a certain extent influences the culture of the organization. So here, when you look at uh, Japanese organization, most senior people or senior positions uh, you know, are, um, are uh, you know, when you look at the CEO, the CXO, they normally you will find in Japanese organization, it is normally men which take up that position. But when you look at a more liberalized culture and uh, a more flatter structure or a culture which is more open, you see there are a lot of women which are heading, uh, you know, as, uh, are heading heads of corporations or organizations and that predominantly seen as the American culture or European culture. But in the Chinese culture or in the Japanese culture, you will normally see a head uh, of the organization is normally a male. So sometimes the management of, uh, you know, when we say uh, uh, talent management within an organization is also to look at reducing, you know, the gender gap. We are talking about some of the basic things which are now being addressed over the last few months. You must have seen in news that a lot of talk is about that there are very few uh, there is a very less representation of women at the board level in most organizations and the highest level of representation uh, you know for female in board positions uh, is within american companies but this culture is now being adopted by or the companies are being forced to adopt this culture even in the Middle Eastern region in the chinese companies and in the japanese companies because mostly you will see the heads of the organization are male but in some cases this is now being uh, favored because they want more women to be in leadership roles or people, uh, you know, organizations are actually promoting the effect, uh, you know, maybe uh, promoting the concept of, you know, uh, women also taking up very senior positions within the organization. And this is a second factor when we look at, you know, the corporate culture or the differences when we look at of culture across organizations when we work in different geographies. So. You will sometimes see that in some countries, uh, you know, the working hours are typically between nine to five and workers are accustomed to working or starting the day early in the morning. Like in the UK, in during winters, you will see that most people start work at 7.38 in the morning and they finish by four. But this might not be a uh, culture in the Middle East because Middle East, they have a holiday on Friday uh, because of prayer time. And in those cases, what they also do is they're a bit more liberal to employees taking breaks because they need to pray four times in a day. So corporate culture and the structure of the organization also plays into, uh, you know, when we look at um, HR managing people within the organization and within that, in a particular geography within the organization. Is that okay? Yes, please. Okay, now the third point that we look at would be employment and tax laws. Now, as companies expand, as you know that in different companies, uh, different countries, there is different taxation. So in the UK, there is 20% VAT. If you go to Germany, it's 21% VAT. If you go to Sweden, it's 22.5% VAT. In the US, there is 12% uh, you know, tax. So when we look at HR's role in employing people, they have to look at compensation, pay wages, pay packages, be dependent on the law and taxation laws in that particular country. So they have to ensure that you know if the salaries or wages are decided, then they are also decided from a context of how much tax, corporation tax or, you know, personal tax the people will have to pay when they look at, you know, um, uh, working within that geography. Sometimes certain emoluments or when we say benefit perks are given to employees in some locations, some countries, you know, some of these are taxable. So in the UK, for example, when you look at healthcare services free, but if you are given dental uh, you know, package or some sort of a dental uh, insurance by the company, then that package is taxed under the uh, benefits, you know, for uh, for employees. So legislation here plays a key part because when we look at, uh, you know, this as a concept of managing job descriptions, within job descriptions, looking at pay packages and perks, 
the HR side of things has to look into some of these factors because this is different for different geographies. And why we are looking at these points is because if we look at an example of Tesco in the UK and Tesco in Turkey, Tesco in Germany, Tesco in Spain, there are different laws, different taxations, different labor laws or different type of laws which govern how employees can be paid, how much hours they need to work, what is considered full time, what is the minimum wage and all these things have to be looked at from a point of view of, you know, looking at globalization. So when a company looks at globalization, you are looking at managing HR side of things within the UK side of prospects. So an HR department in Tesco in the UK would primarily be well versed with all the law and legislation which is applicable in the UK. But this, when the company looks at expanding to another location or opens operation in another location, the specialist branch of HR, in a way, like talent uh, management side of things, uh, get into gear is because they are the ones which need to look at how the pay and other things have to be looked at in correlation with the UK side of things because the head office is based here. So you cannot have a vice president in the UK getting an ex salary and a vice president in Turkey, which is or a vice president in Germany, uh, which is managing the Tesco operations and has similar roles and responsibilities, getting higher perks and benefits as compared to what the employees in UK are getting. So this parity has to be brought in. And that is where, again, this is one of the impact of globalization, which has to be managed under the talent management side of things within HR. Is that okay? Now, when we look at long distance communication challenges, this is one of the other points which requires, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, comes into when we look at globalization is that HR needs to be able to communicate policies. Uh, you know, let's let's look at basic things. When a wage is paid in a particular company, you know, it has to be paid all across. It can't be just it's paid in London branch, in Manchester branch or, you know, in UK alone. Wages are processed across for all employees and nobody's treated differently whether you're working here abroad or in any other location so sometimes when you look at communication and reliance on technology this is also one of the challenge which gets uh, you know comes into being because of globalization of companies operation so if you look at a big company like microsoft or apple or you know when you look at tesco for example in or asda or walmart when you look at walmart has operations in so many countries but when they pay wages, say on 31st, they pay wages and process wages for all geographies, irrespective whether they are in the US, you know, Mexico, you know, in, in, in India or in UK, they will pay wages on 31st for all employees globally. And that uh, is a reliance again uh, on key things like communication has to be streamlined. They have a dependence on technology because all this has to be, you know, communicated to all employees in one go. And this is an effect again of uh, globalization. So in the first part that we want to understand is what is the impact of globalization and talent management. So HR department has to look at specifically within that the talent de uh, management department has to look at how do they not, uh, how do they treat all employees across all locations because of the company's uh, international operations in, 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 in by one yardstick. And these are the things which kind of they have to grapple with things like globalization of human capital, you know, different culture in different countries, employment law and le tax legislation in different countries, and how they tackle in general the communication aspect of it when we look at, you know, uh, the impact of globalization on an organization. Is that okay? Yes. Let's go, okay, let's go to, um, let's go to, you know, now uh, understanding what is the role of you know globalization and how it impacts uh, you know the achievement of goals and objectives and why is it and how is it related to talent management now what we've done in the first few slides is i've summarized here in three points there are reasons or factors which are driving globalization and those globalization factors which affect human resources or talent management are shortage of talent in a particular location so when we look at the example of H1B visas, why the company looks at bringing employees from overseas or from a different location to the US is that that particular talent or in terms of skill set is not available in employees, even if they recruit uh, staff locally. The second is sometimes organizations look at availability of low cost labor from emerging countries. 
So when we look at the example of Primark, when you look at some of the examples of you know companies which are manufacturing clothing in countries wherein the exchange rate is uh, providing them an advantage, like when I look at pound, one pound exchange rate to a Sri Lankan rupee, 212. One pound to a Bangladesh, uh, you know, Taka, 109 pounds. So in this case, the companies are, you know, kind of um, uh, exploiting the availability of low cost labor, which is available in emerging countries or economies wherein the development is still happening. And they have, because of the uh, difference in exchange rates, it allows them to source cheap labor. And that is where they have to then also look at, they get cheap labor, yes, no doubt, or, you know, people at lower wages, no doubt. But they also have to learn the local culture. They have to abide, abide by the law and legislation, look at minimum wage pay laws and things like that, and also pay relevant taxes in that country to be able to open operations there. And last but not the least, when we talked about, you know, things like long-term distance communication or, you know, challenges, because when a company expands to different locations, they also have a challenge to be able to, you know, send across communication all in one go to all people, all employees within the organization, irrespective of whichever location they work for. So these factors which drive globalization actually lead to the definition of why talent management as a department is what created. So the modern role of human resources department, um, you know, when we look at from a point of view of the long term objectives is to focus on managing people as resources and find the right fitment of people to work in right positions in right locations. So here they are focusing on issues which are related to more of, uh, you know, cultural issues, more related to, uh, you know, shortage of talent issues, more related to issues wherein, uh, you know, uh, they are able to find cheaper sources of, uh, you know, raw material and labor, which then allows them to create more profits. And that is the constant you know, striving, which most companies which have global operations is that they want to source cheaper material from different locations. And for that, they are happy to expand or, you know, open up op, uh, operations in a new geography. And that is where the role of HR then becomes international or, you know, it, it starts to differentiate from not, not just managing the daily activities of, you know, recruitment, selection, training, development, dealing with unions or redundancies and things like that, but to look at also planning, hiring, recruiting, and also, you know, managing resources to be deployed in other locations uh, where the company is looking at actually expanding. Now, when we in general talk about, uh, you know, um, the, uh, let, let me put it this way, the three other points when it comes to um, the international operations of a particular company, you look at that a lot of data now is currently also being stored with HR department. Data like, you know, your personal details, your salary details, your pay slips, you look at, you know, your performance appraisals, you know, all those details are primarily also uh, stored with the HR department. Now for them, over the years, what we have seen is that lots of companies have not deployed something called some sort of management information system. And this management information system then has electronic records of all employees which can be retrieved easily because sometimes when a, a vacancy comes up in an organization, if I give you an example, like um, when you look at any multinational organization, so let's look at Microsoft. If there's a vacancy which comes up, what most HR managers, department managers are required to do is post that job internally into the system first because that allows existing employees within Microsoft to apply for that job role. Now for that to happen, they need to have a centralized system through which data can be managed, retrieved, and also distributed so that if a vacancy is coming out in the US, they want to advertise internally on, uh, in, in, the, in the system intranet or the system within Microsoft, and 160,000 employees can see that job. That requires a bit of a, a, you know, a system to handle that, and that allows the company to also save on recruitment selection costs, but also not only that, but also helps them to recruit let's put it this way, people from the existing pool of resources they have within the organization. And in order for them to do that, large organizations, when you look at Hewlett Packard, you know, you look at uh, Fujitsu, you look at, you know, large companies like Huawei, you look at all American companies like Apple, Facebook, you know, Microsoft, LinkedIn, you look at all big UK companies, you know, all the big four retailers, 
they have this system in place you know these systems in place which allow managers or line managers to dip in and put a uh, dip into the company resources and put vacancies out which means that at some stage they should be able to you know recruit people internally within the organization so when you look at data warehousing they need systems like data warehousing they need systems like business analytics and information management systems which are able to then you know allow them to uh, you know look at data which can be uh, you know employee data or uh, personal data which actually can be seen within the organization and that allows people to allow uh, you know apply for those positions internally so that is where you know when we look at this as an aspect these three points in terms of information systems also become important because these are factors which allow hr managers in different geographies to be able to you know better manage um, you know resourcing requirements and dip into the existing talent pool within the organization for uh, you know recruiting people or positions uh, which need to be filled uh, immediately by existing staff which can be given opportunities because of you know uh, being able to apply internally is that okay yes please hello yeah that's fine i think so any questions on this so far um no okay let's look at one of the, the you know last pieces of uh, this particular jigsaw wherein what we want to understand is how talent management actually impacts performance of organizations now when we see and here i'm going to give you an example this is a very theoretical concept but i'm going to give you two odd examples to kind of cover some of these points now when you see most companies what they do is in most companies you will see that when when they have to pick between managers and leaders they look at managers primarily which are uh, they they give preference to people who are managers because they are the ones who are able to get tasks done uh, you know jobs done and here their work in terms of you know working within the company on a day to day operational basis is more important than so this is important is because this is important for them because they need to be able to work on these roles on a day to day basis now when it comes to looking at strategic objectives long term so managers the difference if you recall you know in one of the, uh, the units that we have covered is what is the difference between a manager and a leader managers look after day to day operational job leaders look after strategic or long term uh, you know perspectives or long term uh, you know um, Uh, let's put it this way: long-term vision and objectives of the company. So, what the company is going to do in six months, twelve months, will be looked after by leaders, which are having that experience and you know un- a deeper understanding into the organizational culture, the vision and mission. Managers would be people who are apt and having skills to be able to deal with day-to-day operations, issues or problems which arise because of daily operations in the organization. Now, when it comes to managing these two people, there are two sets of different managements which work. one is on a day to day day basis you are managing employees within the organization which are critical for operations and that is where hr department or human resources the department steps in to look at that because they are looking at managing their performance their expectation but when we look at people who are looking after the long term strategic objectives of the organization in terms of whether we should launch this project whether we should expand operation into this geography or whether we should do this then in those cases you know they will look at uh you know people which will primarily be uh looking after managing senior management and that is where talent management comes in because their requirements and their objectives of you know how the organization will look like in 6 months 12 months would be different from the day to day operational side of things so here the main purpose of management primarily is to look at developing competencies and these competencies would basically be uh you know looked after by when they look at training and development but look after by talent side of things because they need to develop this person into having this skill or they need to be able to have this person have this skill and experience by this time so that they can step into that role now when we look at this and i'll give you an example so that's the theoretical side of things so when we look at this let's give an example we know that every year most companies have appraise appraisals between either the calendar year of jan to december so when the year comes to an end all employees undergo performance appraisal and 
when they undergo performance appraisal, what is the end result of the performance appraisal? Your performance versus the target set or the objective set are measured. And if you achieve those targets, you are in line for some sort of bonus, pay rise, and things like that. Now, this is for employees which are in the lower management, mid management, and you know, people who basically make a day to day difference in terms of solving problems, solving issues, and accomplishing smaller objectives which are defined in their job description. If I look at people who uh, undergo a performance appraisal, but they are in mid management or senior management positions, there the goals would be that you're not achieving a target of 1 million or 2 million, but they are looking at, apart from achieving the targets with your managers or your, with your staff, you're required to achieve a market share of 2% or growth of market share of 0.2%. And on that achievement, they get some additional reward which could be in the form of bonus, it could be in the form of incentives, it could be in the form of, you know, stock options or senior, uh, you know, promotions, which allow them to get larger responsibility. So you see the difference that between the two, when we look at, and the management has to be done, this particular side of things would require at some stage, you know, they would say, okay, you achieved this much, but this year we'll put you under a training program and you're being looking under this training program, you should then be able to, you know, look at uh, getting this skill and that will allow you to perform your job better. So that happens for lower uh, set of employees or people on, a, uh, on the operational level. But when we look at people on the strategic level, they tend to get into programs like you go in for an executive MBA. We will put you into a leadership program or you are looking at taking training into such and such program. And that would differentiate the two because at some stage, the performance or the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, day-to-day um, -day working of that individual helps to achieve the smaller objectives. But at a higher level, the day-to-day -day operations of uh, a senior executive helps in achieving not just the objectives which have been set, but also strategic targets which the company has set or the board has set for that, uh, you know, organization. So in those cases, what we look at is there is a key set of things which are required to be done. And that is where the talent management strategies are put into place because what the company is looking at doing is differentiating the normal from the, uh, you know, um, um, let's say differentiating the people who are doing average performance to good performance to, uh, you know, stellar performance or a performance required, which is over the benchmarks. And that is where the differentiation in terms of, you know, the uh, reports, benefits and other things also comes into place. So if you achieve a simple example would be sometimes you will see that companies when they make an incentive policy, the HR department issues a policy saying that if you achieve 100 percent of your target, you will get this uh, salary plus you will get 0.25 percent bonus on the, uh, you know, income generated. If you do 125 percent, they say, OK, half a percent of the income generated. If you do 150 percent or over, then they say, okay, 1% of the income generated. Now, why is this being done? The company is basically striving to achieve higher productivity, more targets, and more sales. But what they're trying to do is, if you achieve more, you get more. If you achieve more, you not just get more in terms of financial rewards, but in some cases, if you've been consistently achieving more than what has been defined in, the, in your job description, then you're also in line for receiving, you know, other rewards and compensation, which could come in the form of promotion, uh, a change of uh, role and responsibility. It could come in terms of deployment to a different geography or a set of operations, which would be seen as a uh, incentive or a, as a mega promotion that you have received. And last but not the least, you sometimes are put into a training pipeline or some sort of a pipeline to be trained and grouped into a leader for the organization for the future. And that is where the process of, you know, talent management actually starts is because it basically identifies those people which have the right skills and are able to, you know, contribute, um, uh, you know, at the right place to complete and, you know, let's say achieve that business goal or that strategy which the organization or the board has set. And that concept then looks at, you know, having an impact on the organizational performance because that individual or those set of individuals are actually achieving more, contributing more, uh, which is helping the organization grow proportionately more. And that is where they tend to, you know, look at differentiating between, uh, you know, normal performance management 
and performance management in addition to being managing the talent expectation of that individual. Is that okay? Now, this particular figure actually shows very clearly that when you look at how do we associate talent with organizational uh, you know, performance, you will normally see that people who engage more are motivated more and you know, are uh, more loyal to the organization, perform more because they are more keen on achieving uh, more uh, you know, in terms of incentives or more bonuses than individuals who are in keen on you know, just performing their role and also just coming in and doing the job but not exceeding expectations. So to a certain extent, there's a direct relationship between talent management and organizational performance. And if I have to write a few words here, what I would write is motivation. And I would also write loyalty, which you will see, which you will see in employees who uh, you know are more loyal to the organization would actually be seen to be performing more, and they are the ones which will actually, you know, uh, help in improving the overall organizational performance. And that is why we say that at some stage you have to differentiate between, uh, you know, people who perform on an average to people between who perform above average and people who are performing, you know, at a different level. Mm -hmm. And that is where the differentiation has to happen from HR's perspective in terms of compensation, rewards, promotions, performance appraisal, and the perks they get. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. So with this, you know, what we are looking at doing is we more or less uh, have covered, you know, the three learning outcomes, you know, in this particular unit. And the key aspect, just to summarize, is to understand how talent management is slightly different from the process of human resources planning and the usual functions of HR. And why is talent management becoming important in today's context is because of globalization. It's because of increasing complexity of companies' operation, employment of diversity of workforce, uh, and then also looking at things which are primarily, you know, bringing into things like dealing with different legislation in different countries, and the role of information, which is now critical for, uh, you know, companies, even on the human resources department side, that you need real-time information on employees, on your staff, and that is where the you know the management information systems are also contributing to the complexity of you know managing talent because in earlier days very short example that I give in earlier days what happens is when before the advent of mobile and the internet you will see that one branch office was doing quite well but the report of that was only available to the maybe the uh, you know the area manager or the regional manager of another branch office only. But now because information is available easily because of the accessibility and uh, you know of internet and communication and telecommunication, it is not very difficult for the employees to find out who's performing uh, in which location and how much pay or package uh, and reward the person is getting. So in order to better manage this, the organization has to create a differentiated tiered structure and that requires management of resources, which is people resource in particular, and when people perform above average, when they perform and contribute to achieving strategic objectives for the organization, they are they tend to be what is called talent managed because they need supervision, they need their guidance, they need uh, you know um, let's put it this way resources which are commensurate to the performance they are giving to the organization, and that is where you know this concept of talent management actually becomes quite important. So very briefly, what we'll also do is um, look at the assignment brief, you know, for this unit. Let's me pull out the assignment brief. So in the assignment brief, what you will see is that here there are two tasks which have to be done. Now, one of the first tasks is you've been asked to assume that you are the, if I find this is visible. You are working as an HR manager in a multinational IT company, and your company has employees from different parts of the world working as consultants. Now, as a part of CPD, which is Continuous Professional Development Seminars in your company, you are asked to prepare 10 PowerPoint slides on global talent management, which can be presented in 20 minutes. So the topic is, how does global talent management, what is global talent management? So here you are looking at covering the definitions of global talent management, and how does mm -hmm. it benefit organization? Organization, okay. 
The second, so benefits to the organization is uh, that, you know, you're looking at covering points which are basically related to the talent, seven step talent management process. Okay. 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 The second point is looking at role of HR managers in global talent management. So who within the HR department manages talent? And when we say that global talent management, why are, uh, you know, what is the role of HR managers? So here you are looking at covering, you know, things which are related to the factors which impact management of, uh, you know, resources within organization. And that's been covered in learning outcome two. Now the third point is key factors which are required to be considered. So key factors we've covered some of them today, like globalization, law and legislation, these are factors which need to be considered because you cannot have a $15 minimum wage pay uh, applicable in the UK because the laws are different here or vice versa. And the last point in the presentation that you have to address is that what are the barriers to effective talent management? So we have covered the barriers, uh, about six of them in the presentation, and this will constitute your task one. Now in task two, what you have to do is you have to create a handout basically for the presentation that you've done. And in that presentation, you have to detail the tasks which have been covered by creating a handout which can be provided to, you know, as, as like a speaker note to the uh, participants. So basically, whatever you're doing is you're making a PowerPoint presentation here. And with the PowerPoint presentation, you are now preparing speaker notes which will cover tasks like impact of globalization, uh, the role of global talent management, and the impact of talent management on organizational performance, which we will cover today. Uh, uh, could you please go back to uh, the beginning? I want to see some mm. because I feel it's the same thing, only that you'll be adding more points to tax two. Because in tax one, you're being asked the um, what global talent management is and its benefit. Mm. And yes, the other one is the roles of human resource managers and the benefit of um, uh, the benefit of global management, um, talent management. You talked about the seven steps yes. in global management ta talent, talent, global talent management. I beg your pardon. So yes. now you're telling me to prepare handouts for the participants for tax two. It's yes. like adding flesh to bone to what I've done in PowerPoint slides. That is correct. Right? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. So basically, what I would suggest is in the PowerPoint slide, you're making 10 to 15 slides, and you're basically 10 to, covering 10 to 15 slides, and these four points you are covering. Okay. Okay. Now, in the speaker notes, you are actually picking up an organization, which is given here that you are an IT company, so you can make any IT company. You might choose Microsoft or you know Apple, any any IT company you know, okay. HP, any IT company, Dell, and what you are looking at doing is you are actually putting meats on, meat on the bones, then you are saying, for this IT company, what is the impact of globalization? Like, if you look at, if I pick up Dell, Dell started manufacturing pieces in China or in Taiwan because... Oh, so I want to pick a company of my choice as a case study. Yes, you can pick a company of your choice, yes. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So it is like a bit of a handout, which is you are creating for the slides you have done, but in slides, mm -hmm. in presentation slides, you are basically explaining the theory. But in the handouts, you are actually picking up an example and showing the application of that theory for a particular IT company. Oh, okay. 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 And this do not need. This does not need to be more than two and a half, uh, two to two and a half thousand words. Two thousand plus ten percent. Thousand words. Yeah. Uh, okay. 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 And this will cover the whole of the three learning outcomes that we have covered for this unit. Okay, okay. Any questions and queries? Okay. I can access the module. I can access the module for, for, for the handouts and the materials, right? Yes. Okay, okay. So I'll try to get that done. And also the presentation uh, here right now so that you are able to, uh, you know, access it pretty much immediately after the lecture. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, then one more thing. Uh, am I, I? I think I can. I don't know if you can set up uh, another session for me next week. So before my mom leaves, so I can cover up maybe unit six. What I will do is I will. It will be around 
28th or 29th, I will set up some sessions. Oh my God, my mom is leaving then. She would have so left. My mom. This is up until 27th, uh, 28th, uh, you know, we are off in uh, in the UK because of Christmas Eve, uh, you know, Christmas, Boxing Day. But Okay, can I just ask for a favor? Is it possible for me to receive lectures tomorrow? Because my mom would have left by then and it would be difficult for me to receive lectures with two kids. Because my son is resuming school March next year. So I, that, that's the challenge I have. I, I was thinking I will cover, 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 the, uh, cover all the units before she leaves and I'll be battling with assignments with the kids. I can be able to do that and read in the middle of the night. Uh, that will be easy for me. But now that you're saying uh, you, the, um, the, the school is closing, I don't know if you can fix lectures for me tomorrow or next so I can cover unit six. And I know that I have unit seven left. Then I'll I, just. I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. I understand, I understand. But I think difficult for me to look at anything, uh, you know, around the 20, say, 25th, 26th, today, tomorrow, and the after, because for my parents, which have come over, and obviously I've got some oh. shopping plans, things like that. Oh. So the earliest I can do some classes for you would be 27th and 28th and 29th. Mm -hmm. 27th, 28th, 29th. Well, oh, oh, okay. My mom would have left then, but I'll, I'll see what I can do. What I what I will try and do is I will try and see for unit six if I can do some recordings and then obviously send uh, them over. Because what okay. I want to do uh, in the unit six, let's. We are doing it now. And just give me one second. 